I want to welcome all those watching online, those in a video venue here at our Keller campus. We're glad you joined us for the last week of Seeds. Would you put your hands together and welcome everybody that's joining us online. We're glad you're along for the ride. It's our last week. It's a little bit bittersweet. I've so enjoyed this journey with you. I've heard so many testimonies of your small groups and the discussions that have been happening and how God's speaking to you. And he's speaking to me equally as much as I've had the opportunity to share it with you. And I'm going to ask you this week in our last week as we look to actually the tagline of the series where we think about tomorrow. Because tomorrow starts today. We're going to think about tomorrow a little bit. I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles to turn with me to John 15. It's going to take me a minute to get there as we start thinking about from the words of Jesus. The fact is, seeds, if you're new with us, you can go online and watch the messages. We had a guide that our team produced. We had hundreds of small groups and thousands of you meeting and talking about seeds. You're like, why would we talk about seeds? Is this like agriculture class or what does the Bible have to say about it? Actually, a lot. The beginning of the Bible starts in a garden. We've been talking about seeds. The principle of seeds starts there. Jesus is described as a seed. The word of God is a seed. There are soil preparation and soil types and Jesus continues to exhort us to think about the soil of our heart because the seed has all the potential. The seed is perfect. The seed performs every time we have to work on the soil of our heart. We've been talking about trees. The most common, third most common noun in the Bible, you may be surprised to know, is trees. There's a tree in the garden. Jesus hung on a tree. Trees are all the way through the Bible. The Bible talks about the righteous being compared to a tree that flourishes. I learned something this week a little bit interesting, a little bit new for me, and that is in the Ark of the Covenant. Some of you are like, what's that? Well, I don't have time to teach it all to you. It's like an important piece of furniture where God's spirit dwells and presence was there. But anyway, <laughs> they carried him around with them. And in that Ark, I find interesting that there were three things, the commandments and the tablets, and then there was a bowl of manna, a jar of manna, and there was a tree in the Ark of the Covenant. You're like, what kind of tree was it? I find it interesting, this rod of Aaron's that budded. The truth is it was signifying God's confirmation of the priesthood in Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, but the type of tree that it was, I think, sort of lends itself. It at least is intriguing and interesting and got me thinking this week toward what I want to talk to you about because it was an almond tree in an almond tree in Hebrew culture, there was this understanding about what it was communicating. And I don't know if God, I, I didn't dig probably deep, deep, deep into it, but it's like, it's in there, it's important. An almond tree is interesting because it blossoms first. It blossoms first, but its fruit, the almond, is much later than all the other trees. And it has this thought that there's the hastening of old age, that life comes to us faster than we imagine, that we look up one day and we've been living a series of moments, we've been running to a series of meetings, we've been accomplishing a series of tasks, we've been checking off things on our list and our bucket list, and when you add it all up, you call it a life. And it goes by really quick and you only have one of them. So this week, I wanna end our series by talking about something that we all care about, but I wanna give you a gift. Because the fact is, we're inundated with all the things of this life and most of the time, we don't think about what I wanna give you as a gift that I can share with you and us think about a little bit. We don't think about 30, 40, 50, 60, we don't think about tomorrow. We don't think about our legacy that we're gonna leave behind. We don't have a lot of time to. Some of you are like, think about my legacy, I'm just trying to make it to Friday. I'm just trying to get to the end of the week and survive. Survival's been my goal. Well, I wanna give you a gift, so for the next few moments, I, I want us to pause. 
want you to put away your calendar. I want you to put away your plans and let's think about tomorrow. Jesus actually said in John 12 that a seed, he's describing himself, if it dies and goes into the ground, it can produce a multiplication of seeds. That, that his life, now Jesus' unique life is obviously, and if you don't know it, it's because of Jesus' sacrificial life that he died and was resurrected that we just sang about in worship. The truth is that when his seed comes into the garden of your heart, you have no life until that happens. You, you are doing things. You, you are doing life, but you're not living until Jesus comes to live inside of you. He's the one who brings life into our lives. But I think a secondary application is, is it, it's interesting that in Jesus's life, though he had this, this mission from his father that he wanted to please him to fulfill, in this statement, Jesus, a secondary application because he lives in us, there's this thought that we can kind of think eternal too. We can think beyond the mundane activity of frivolous things. We, we, because he lives in us, can have his perspective on life. We can think about tomorrow because the one who holds the future lives in us. He lives in us. So I want us to do that for just a moment together. I want you to think just a minute about a moment that will happen to all of us. I want to give you a gift, as I said. I'm, I'm a person who pursues mentorship and coaching and help with life. I mean, I, I view love through you wanting to see me reach my potential. It's just the way I grew up. I, you know, a lot of people today are like, you love me if you agree with me. I don't see love as agreement if you're doing something that will destroy your life. You love me if you tell me how to reach the potential that God's put on the inside of me. So I've pursued mentors and coaches and over the last several years working with the coach and thinking about life and helping me keep a good scoreboard. You know, we all have a scoreboard. And the saddest thing in our generation is a lot of people, they end up reaching the tally on the scoreboard only to find they won a game that they don't really care about that they won a victory that doesn't matter really for eternity. And so I asked this gentleman to help me and you start taking and writing down some things in your life and putting it together. It's obviously, again, not just a self-help program, it's a spiritual journey with God. You're, you're thinking about your garden, you're thinking about what you're planting, you're thinking about the fruit of your life and asking God to help you see it through his lens. And one of the things that I found interesting, I just want to offer it to you as a gift, is the first thing he had me do was write out my eulogy. Kind of morbid. Kind of like, wow, really? I don't really want to think about that. I'm feeling pretty young. I'm feeling pretty powerful. Some of you are like, your eulogy? What is a eulogy? Well, it's kind of a preacher term. There's this thing called a funeral. And at a funeral, you have several elements. You maybe have some music. You maybe have someone give a prayer. And you have maybe a sermon. And usually there's this portion where you talk about the person in the box. You talk about them. Or maybe they're in a vase. I don't know. Wherever they're at. Maybe they're already in the ground and we just have a picture. But you talk about them. You're like, Pastor, how do you do that? I've done... Hundreds. I don't know how many I've done. I've done lots. If I don't know the person, then I, from the funeral home, get what's called the minister's copy of the obituary that has the facts about this person in the box, where they were born and where they lived and where they worked and who will they leave behind. And so I give all the facts and information. And if I didn't know them, I usually just preach the gospel and leave it at that. Because I learned as a young pastor, you don't want to be the guy out there talking about the person in the box and all the people sitting in the service are like, you got the wrong guy. It's not him. So I kind of try to keep it safe. And I, I found, interestingly enough, I found that a lot of times you learn the most about the person by meeting with the family. I'll, I'll give you a little insider, language, insider information. When you sit with the family and say, tell me what you want to say about this person, a lot of times what they say I want said are not the things that the person prioritized. It's not the deadline you didn't meet or the thing that's really got you perturbed this week. 
It's when you took me to ice cream and it was just because. It was when you cared about this or that. It's really fascinating to listen to what the family prioritizes over what we a lot of times get so stirred up about. Sometimes it's kind of difficult. I, early on in ministry, I opened up the floor when I didn't know the person. I would open up open mic. That, we don't do that in church anymore. It doesn't go well. There's a reason that we only let certain people on the mic. Because I opened up the floor and one time I, the son got up and said, dad really loved cars. They buried him in a NASCAR motif. He had some bailing wire, JB Weld, and a pair of pliers in his hand. The end of the service, they played Hot Rod Lincoln. <laughs> Want to drive me in a drinking? If you don't, go ahead and drive in that Hot Rod Lincoln. I'm like, praise the Lord. <laughs> One time I opened up the floor and nobody talked. I was standing there. There was a person there and they were all just, I was just like, anybody got anything? Anything for the eulogy? Crickets. One lady stood up and she said, you know, Lucy really knew how to party. I said, Praise the Lord. Um, there's casserole in the fellowship hall. We're going to dismiss now. There's, there's food back there. We're just glad you came today. Something's going to be said about you. The problem is to think into the future is harder than it's ever been for us as a culture. Because everything that we have is instant. Everything in our world, when Jesus starts talking about a seed going into the ground and dying, when we talk about this whole series, a seed that is planted and then there's nurture and then the soil's taken care of and it bears fruit later and there's a time lapse in Genesis 8, 22, that there is a seed time harvest. It's hard for us because we live in a world of Amazon Prime. I need it in 24 hours. How many of you remember when you used to order stuff out of catalogs? I mean, one that I thought of as a kid, Scholastic Reader. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Scholastic Reader. Like, this was the greatest marketing strategy in human history. Prey on the emotions of children. Get them to buy books that they will not read because their teacher says, if we buy enough, we'll get a new overhead projector. And if we beat the other class, we get a pizza party. So you get that. Come on, everybody. So you get that thing, you haven't read the last five books and you're checking them off. Boy, you know what that would, your mom's like, look, you need to get something that's like a real literary work. I'm like, I like the scratch and sniff stickers. Y'all know, come on. You get your trapper keeper with some pickle and chocolate. Pickle, chocolate, come on. So you ordered it. Maybe you ordered a piece of clothing out of a catalog. Anybody? It takes four to six weeks and you've already changed sizes by the time you get it and forgot you bought it. Now, 24 hours, next day delivery. Our world is immediate, our world is instant. So we live in today not thinking about what I invest in today will affect my tomorrow. Jesus gives us a little insight into a perspective in John 15. He's, he's giving a very important discourse in these chapters. See, Jesus, if you might say it this way, he kind of gave his eulogy before he died. So this is what I'm all about. He explains it all in his final words. And in John 15, he says, I am the true vine. He's given parables of the false vine that doesn't bear fruit that will last and is not fruit at all. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Can I encourage you with something? Today's talk is I talk about legacy and the future and we're gonna get more and more practical. I wanna be very clear. This is not just life planning seminar. If the father in heaven and Jesus Christ, the true vine, do not get in your garden, what you're living for will burn up. You have no true fruit until Jesus gets into your garden until you let God start showing you what fruit is. I'm witnessing to a young couple right now that are dating. I've kind of got a little connection with the guy and I'm trying to connect with his girlfriend because the weight of the guy is the girlfriend. You know what I'm saying? He's like, I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. She gets saved and I'm coming to church. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she loves plants. She wants, she's getting a greenhouse. 
She's young. I was like, really interesting. I said, I'm preaching on plants right now. I said, what's the number one thing that keeps other people from being able to be good with plants? I asked her that this week. She thought about it a minute. She said, most people don't know how to take care of anything. I said, why do you like plants? She said, I like to nurture them. Can I encourage you with something? God knows how to take care of your life. God knows how to garden your soul, your life, your future. Will you let him become the gardener of your garden? He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes. It's like prune. Ouch! We've been in a year of pruning. I'm so tired of living through unprecedented events. This is unprecedented. Like, well, let's take normal. We'll, we'll take normal. We'll take regular. We'll take routine. <laughs> he's been pruning us a little bit, but if he's the gardener, if he's pruning your life, it's so that it will be even more fruitful. It will be even more fruitful. So when you go through a season of pruning, there's joy on the other side because there's more fruit because he's the gardener. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me. So I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. You can't leave a legacy by yourself. You need the gardener. You will leave behind some things. You will leave behind some money. There will be some sorting out of your assets. There will be some will and some probating and all of that, but you will leave behind nothing of consequence if you're not connected to the true vine. Remain in me and also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Skip down to verse 16 where we think about legacy. We think about tomorrow. Jesus actually says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Fruit that will last. When I memorized this verse as a kid, fruit that remains. You ever thought about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 100 years from now, should Jesus tarry and even into eternity, what you invest in today, if you're connected to the vine and have this perspective, can outlive you. Can outlive you. Fruit that remains. And it is that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. I remember one time where I thought about seeds sowing legacy, time. My grandmother could grow things. She had fruit trees, she had plants, she canned, she knew how to grow things. And she planted an interesting plant, it's called a century plant. You may have heard of it, you may not have heard of it, but the only people that plant a century plant are people that can actually think long-term. People that are really people who are kind of very odd in today's world. It takes 30 years for it to bloom. And I remember when it bloomed and it was a big deal and it was like the newspaper in our small town came, I think, and took a photo. You know, I don't know, the family gathered around. I was like, boof, you know, there it is. 30 years for it to bloom. Did you know everyone leaves a legacy? It's just a matter of what kind. I want to give you a gift. What is it that you're investing in today that you will carry about, you will really care about 30 years from now? What will matter 30 years from now that may not bloom for 30 years? Kind of wired this way. I got to tell you, I began thinking this way early in my life, but grew in it as I continue to see what really matters. I want to encourage you there's no condemnation that's never too late. Some of you are like, wow, I wish I would have learned this earlier. It's never too late. By the way, a seed is impartial. A seed never says, wait, before you plant me, how old are you? (laughs) The seed doesn't care what you've messed up. It doesn't care where you've been. The seed of the word of God will still work no matter where you're at or what station you're at. But I remember even, it it gets me emotional. Uh, That song was not like a sad song, but like even watching our young people Sing about seeds. When the seed goes low. I just, yeah, yeah. I just thought about all those kids up here in the county. 
let the seed go low. Because I'm at a phase now in my life where I'm seeing some seeds, watching them grow. Might take 30 years. I remember when I turned 40, my friends and family had a little moment to read things over you know, my life, 40 years old. And I was teaching our staff team because when we started Milestone Church, know this, we started with a multi-generational vision. It's too much work, it's too much investment, it's too much time to pour into something that can't outlive us. And so I was preaching to our team about multi-generation, that we're going to raise up the next generation. We're not just going to feed them pizza and hang out in the back. We're going to train them, and they're going to lead as good as people that are 80. We're going to let them do the stuff, and we're going to let them lead, and I'm amazed at them and watching that, but we cast that vision early. Had one of my colleagues and friends, she came up to me. She was very sincere. I wasn't upset with her, but she made a comment. She said, she said, it's interesting that, you know, when you turn 40, you kind of get nostalgic. I said, well, not really. I've been thinking about future generations since I was in my 20s. I've been thinking about it since I was in my 20s. It's an impartation. I want to give you some principles today for a legacy life. I want to give you three things in our final moments together to think about it practically because you're like, I want to think that way. How do you do that? What is the practicals of it? Because tomorrow starts today. The first thing you have to do is you have to see it. You see it with spiritual eyes. You're, you're not going to get credit from the world. You're not going to get accolades from the world. You're, not, you're going to have to zig when everybody else is zagging. You're going to have to make the long play, and the long play is not always the easy play. You have to make the investment. It is a different way of seeing it. But when you see it, it's an impartation. It's an impartation. The dream for my life is not how many people can I preach to. I love to preach the gospel. And every preacher loves to preach as many, to as many as he can at one time because it's kind of efficient. But my dream for my life is not maybe I could fill Texas Motor Speedway with the largest crowd of people and get in the middle of the audience and be like, today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I know this, when I walked away from that, I would feel joy about one person who accepted Christ, but it wouldn't fulfill my soul like watching what we saw here. So the dream for my life, my dad actually, I, I lived it about a year and a half ago with my dad in the living room in which I grew up with his grandkids and family. My vision for my life before I experienced it with my own father is that one day my natural children and my spiritual children will say, go on home. We got it from here. We, we got it. We'll carry it on. My dad's funeral was more than a service. It was an impartation for those that were there. It's a legacy, but you have to see it. It's got to get down in the fabric of your soul to where it changes you. I thought about it the other day because I got an email from Clyde, who's in our church, who's in his 70s. He wanted to tell me that his small group was really exciting and they were having great conversation. And the little box and the seeds and the plants, they actually made theirs grow. So you feel condemned now because yours is dead. <laughs> his grew because he knows how to take care of stuff. But as I read his email and he was encouraging me with the series and the messages, I started thinking about the backstory because it's a legacy story. See, Clyde used to live in Plano and his daughter Karen started coming to our church and she was agnostic. She was kind of void of God. She said, I didn't, I didn't know if God was there, but I certainly didn't believe he wanted to have a relationship with me. She said, I went a couple of times to religious services on holidays, but she was invited to our ladies' event, and she experienced the presence of God, and she saw the generosity of God's people. She gave her life to Jesus. She accepted Christ. Her family changed. Her husband, who I was kind of drawn to because he was a Baylor graduate, which means God's favor is on his life, <laughs> got Lou Gehrig's disease and passed away tragically a few years ago, and our church rallied around her now as a widow. But I thought about Clyde's story when he sent me his little box. I thought it's never too late. It's never too late because now Clyde's leaving a legacy because of the salvation of a daughter and then Clyde comes to the services because his daughter's been changed and he gave his life to Christ and now generations are changed because that's a legacy story. But you have to see it to live that way. The second thing you have to do 
is once you see it, you have to change your mindset and your mindset is what changes your behavior. Because as a man thinks, so is he. I call these two mindsets in our culture today the right now mindset and the legacy mindset. The right now mindset is I'm aiming at how culture defines success. I'm aiming at what the world says the scoreboard is. I'm aiming at he who has the most toys wins. I'm aiming at my career only or I'm aiming at my, my net worth or whatever you put it as or my leisure or my t- whatever it might be, I'm, I'm aiming at that scoreboard. I'm so focused, this is real life, I'm so focused on today, I can't think about my legacy. That's why I'm giving you the gift today. Think about it, because it's gonna happen. Think about it. I just continue through life and activity and I kind of let life happen to me, but I never happen to life in the way that I'm letting Jesus guide me as the gardener and telling me the fruit he wants me to bear. I react to what happens instead of creating intentional moments. I I just kind of react. By the way, I wanna encourage some of you that say, I want a legacy mindset, but the people that I wanna invest that in and the relationships that I wanna invest that in, like they're not responding. But, But let me encourage you, every time you plant a seed, God will, his word does not return void. So keep going. So what happens is we feel rejection. Some of you pastoring and parenting teenagers, that they are good rejectors. Don't don't receive it. Keep pressing into the soil. Keep sowing into the soil. Keep engaging with the soil. Don't react. Be intentional. I assume it will just happen. I think this is where a lot of people are. I just assume one day that it'll just happen Can I encourage you from my vantage point, I'm a little further than some and some of you are a little further than me, but here's what I've learned. The legacy ground of the soil garden that I'm investing in, I I am amazed at how much intentionality it takes. You're like, didn't we cover this? Huh? I no comprende, I don't get it. I've told you five times. How many of you know it takes a lot of intentionality to transfer value? to transfer fruit that remains. Doesn't just happen. There'll be plenty of time later. That's what a lot of people think. I'll get to that one day when I get to that station in life. But tomorrow starts today. What you're investing in today. One of the most popular funeral songs of our generation, I was surprised to find. Not Amazing Grace, but Frank Sinatra's song, I Did It My Way popular in our world. I thought I'd look up a few of the lyrics. For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. Prideful statement. Prideful song, but very common. Did you think about your legacy? No, I did it my way. Can I make a better recommendation? What about do it his way? What about let him be the gardener and let him begin to produce fruit that remains through your life? Here's a legacy mindset. A legacy mindset is I'm aiming at how the Bible defines success. The Bible doesn't really use the word success. It uses fruit. I'm aiming at Jesus honoring fruit. I'm aiming at God honoring fruit. That's the scoreboard that I'm going to put in front of my life. I'm going to aim at that. I don't wait. I think about my legacy now. I'm not waiting. I'm I'm, I'm starting today. I'm starting now at whatever station, whether seven years old, getting baptized, or wherever you're at and watching these men. I'm just telling you, that's a miracle to watch these grown men. They're all bald and beautiful. I noticed that. I don't know if you did. (laughs) That's generation changing activity right there if those men will step up and begin to sow the word of God into their homes and into their lives. Start today. I'm not waiting for tomorrow, I'm starting now. That's a legacy mindset. I create intentional relational moments toward my legacy because sometimes it's more caught than it is taught. I'm gonna invest the energy and the time to create those moments where those values can be caught. 
And I want to encourage everybody with this. Again, this is not like a seminar on legacy planning or just some life hack. I partner with God. Some of you are like, I'm not seeing what I want to see or did I mess this up or did I do that? That's the wrong mindset. Here's our job. We partner with God. I plant the seeds. I trust him to make it grow. I'm connected to the vine and I let him live through me and and I keep growing and I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be because he's changing me. He's changing me all along the way. And over time, he begins to grow those seeds. I want to be even more practical as we close and before I pray for you. I want to be super, super practical. The third thing is your legacy is the fruit that remains. And I prayed for you this week because it's something that stirs in me when I'm talking to you about. But it's like, how do you make it real? Jeff, what are you talking about? Like, how does Jesus do that in us? What does that mean? You say it's so countercultural. What does it really look like? Well, I want to make it super practical. Everything I just shared with you in this series on seeds and the power of the soil and the heart and the investment and the word of God and Jesus, the new seed that comes into our lives and everything about this series and everything about what I'm sharing with you today, it's all worth it if one young person listening to me, one young person listening to me right now doesn't wait till they're 40 to think about their legacy. If one young person, now some of us would be like, whoo, right over their head. But I'm praying for maybe just one who says, you know what? My dating life now is affecting my marriage tomorrow. My marriage will affect my children's children. So I'm going to start sowing seeds to that important relationship now while I'm young. Seven years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. Let the seed go low. (laughs) Let the seed go low. Let the seed go low because it's going to grow. If one young person listens to me and says, I'm going to sell out to the word of God, I'll let it get low. I'll let it get low. It'll start to grow because the word works every single time. If one empty nester listening to me realizes that it doesn't matter if you didn't know or you feel real excited about what you've invested in, it's not too late. It's one thing I love about spiritual family is it's it's an opportunity even beyond your own natural children to invest in the next generation. When we started our church, I did a SWOT analysis. Don't criticize me, it's just how I'm wired. (laughs) Because man, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I had a lot of opportunity, nobody was here. So growth was really a great potential. (laughs) Lots of threats, we had no money. But I was 28 years old. And I realized that, man, I had a lot of energy, but it's like, how do we trust him? But I was preaching the same stuff I'm preaching to you today at 28 years old. And I would just tackle every empty nester I met at 28 years old. And I'd tell him, I'd say, I know we're young, and you can go live your life with all the people your age at a country club church, or you can come here and make an investment in the next generation that'll outlive you. Can I speak to some of you here? The need in our generation for spiritual moms and dads that'll take these young people under your wing and help them understand and the mistakes you made on your kids, help them keep them from making the same mistakes on theirs. How many of you know you learn? That's why you like, I have four kids, you know, one's one's an accessory. (laughs) The first one, you just do everything wrong. The fourth one just gets a better parent. Y'all know what I'm saying? They're like, they get away with everything. No, we just actually have a little grace now because we're too tired. (laughs) But I realized, I realized that this weakness was actually an opportunity. And I would say it to some of you, if I, if there's one couple that would say, you could have a legacy in heaven of people who say, thank you for giving to the Lord and investing your life. One business leader in our church decides every open door is not a God door. The scoreboard of my net worth may not be the right decision in the right season. Sometimes the greatest opportunity may be the greatest damage to your legacy, sometimes. We don't understand in our culture seasons. We want it all now. Remember, we want Amazon Prime today. 
And you may say, you know what? You may think I'm crazy, sir, or ma'am, or your boss. I may be able to make triple the income, but I got these little seeds at my house. And I just can't travel like that, or I just can't do that because this is way too important to me. So I'm going to make a crazy decision that may not make financial sense today, but it'll actually be what I care about later. If one business leader listens to me this weekend and says, I'm going to look crazy at my job, but I'm going to actually invest in my legacy, this whole series is worth it. Let me talk to young families for a minute. Let me talk to you for a second. Young moms, nothing on Instagram is going to tell you what I'm going to tell you as your pastor. I meet so many young moms that are like, I just don't understand. Or even dads in the family, the young family today, it's like, I have sippy cups and, and divers and, and granimal crackers and are they animal crackers or granimal? I don't know. This is, <laughs> I am doing nothing of significance. Let me speak to you right now. You're investing the most important seed you possibly can. If one young family listens to me to say, you know what? That's important. And we're going to make decisions that invest in our legacy. You know, we're going to have one of the greatest transfers and now are having the greatest transfer of wealth that the world has ever known. People are making life transitions and life, the, the baby boomers are getting older and we have all of this resource. Can I just say something to all of you as you begin to plan? Like I appreciate any effort to serve broken humanity, but even with our resources, we should think about fruit that remains. We should think about not just aesthetically pleasing things for the world. That's okay to do that. But I'm going to tell you, we don't want to just have an aesthetically pleasing world of different great little frivolous things that are also given to a group of people who will spend eternity in hell. We should begin to think about the resources to advance the kingdom. And as you begin your life plan, I would think that, and, and most of the resources of our world, billions and billions of dollars, will go to non-eternal causes. We should think about that. My wife, about six months before my dad passed away, she kept hearing him mention a scripture that he had mentioned multiple times. In the last season, when my parents would come here, my wife would Spent a lot of time listening to him, and she, she's a good listener. Not everybody's a great listener. She listens. I'm usually talking. <laughs> and she said one day to him as he sat there, it's six months before he died, this scripture is important to you. It's really important. So... She had him tell her the scripture and his granddaughter wrote it into a frame. We all have it hanging in our house because he loved the word of God. The verse out of Isaiah says, my spirit will be upon you and my word will come out of your mouth. And it'll carry on to your offspring and your offspring's offspring. So every morning, before God started to prune me and my house flooded, and I had to take everything down and my house is packed up, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. It hangs right outside my room. So when I wake up in the morning, before I face the day, I think about his word will not return void. Let the seed go low. It'll grow. It'll grow. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow your heads with me. Because there's some of you here, you say, I haven't really thought about that day. But a gift I give you today is that day is approaching. And the almond tree that's in the Ark of the Covenant reminds us that old age hastens. It comes to us quicker than we think. And you say, I want to leave a fruit that remains. I want to think about an eternal life. 
you have the opportunity to make the most important eternal decision you ever have, and that is to let the gardener introduce you to the true vine, Jesus. You can bear no fruit apart from him. If you're not right with him, he's not the Lord of your life today, let me just tell you, he wants to have a relationship with you. And just like we heard Darren who said, I did works and I kept feeling like a failure, but one day I received Jesus and everything changes. You can do that today too. So I ask you to say, Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, I surrender my garden to you. I surrender my life to you. Let your, the seed of who you are come into my life. I believe you died for me. You rose from the dead. I accept you today as my personal Lord and Savior you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to let us know. It's important to tell somebody because now you are a new creation. You're born again. You're like a little child and you need the church to help you grow. We're here to help you. So if you would let us know if you're online in the chat or come to 101 or talk to someone or fill out a card. How many of you would say, Pastor Jeff, maybe online or in a service, say, I feel like God's talking to me about my legacy. Would you pray for me? Would you just lift your hand and say, would you pray for me, Pastor Jeff? I believe God's speaking to me. So it's not, he doesn't speak it to everyone, but I believe a lot of you are receiving that today. And Lord, I ask you, Lord, we wanna not bear our own fruit, not plan our own lives. We wanna have fruit that remains. And the only way that happens, Lord, is we surrender it to you. Lord, show us, because you are such a great gardener. Show us how to plant the right things, to invest in the right things, to be intentional. You're an amazingly intentional God who works in the garden of our lives in ways we can't imagine. So Lord, today we choose to plant the seed of the word into our hearts and into those around us so that that seed will bear fruit and fruit that remains. I pray, Lord, for beyond my words, but an impartation, not just information, to everyone listening. In Jesus' name, amen.